Good evening everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, free webcast from Online EU Training. Let me introduce myself. My name is Gabor Mikesh. I am the Managing Director of uh, Arboreus, the company that operates Online EU Training. And um, this afternoon we are going to talk about um, the Pactetis, uh, uh, popularly known as Pactetis exams, which are uh, officially known as the um, repeat of the 2010 EPSO AD uh, competitions. More specifically, um, a very large EPSO AD5 competition and, um, and, uh, and two other uh, specialist competitions as well. Um, I'm just going to wait um, a second here to get confirmation from my colleague that uh, the sound is okay and uh, then we are going to um, continue um, with the webcast. Just one second please. Okay, so there's a little bit of delay. Uh, uh, it's not uh, exactly live. Uh, we promised it is not um, intentional. This is not to uh, censor um, not, not a, because of censorship, it's just the um, technology uh, doesn't allow us to be absolutely live. So uh, let's continue. Um, a couple of words about online EU training. I'm sure you're already familiar uh, with us. Perhaps um, um, you've known us since 2010. Um, but um, just to be sure, we are a community of over 70,000 uh, people uh, on our website. And um, we also have a Facebook page with now more than 30,000 fans. and uh, uh, what we are united in is uh, a passion for EU jobs and, uh, and uh, performing well at the EPSO competitions. Um, so how do we achieve that or how do we help that uh, happen? Um, we offer two main things, uh, test packages and uh, webinars. Uh, we have over 23,000 questions in our database uh, which were um, uh, used over 15 million times by our users. and um, are webinars, methodology webinars, which uh, help you um, master the pre-selection tests are also uh, very popular. Um, we have held over 150 hours of uh, webinars and uh, trained over 6,000 participants uh, over the course of several years. Okay. Um, Sorry, I, I was just told that the uh, there was some audio audio problems, so hopefully it's all um, all uh, good now. So let's continue. Uh, let's look at um, um, the the agenda uh, of the, uh, the webinar. We are basically talk about going to talk about how to get into the EU institutions, as, um, specifically in the context of um, of the Pactetis or repeated 2010 competitions and um, hopefully by the end of this webcast uh, we, we will be able to say that there are better ways to do this than um, the guy on this uh, picture who decided to pop into a box. So let's see uh, what we are going to cover. Well most of you are already familiar with the uh, overall uh, selection process which means that we are not going to bore you with um, with um, the details of you know whether you are eligible or not because that's that was already determined in 2010. All you had to do uh, this year in 2013 is select a, an exam um, center uh, where you can attend uh, the pre-selection test. So we're going to talk about just the basics and the different profiles. Um, we're going to quickly overview the number of positions that are available and this is important because we are already um, uh, in possession of the information of how many people applied um, uh, for the various um, positions in the, um, in the various profiles and that means that we can um, uh, that means that we can uh, talk a little, bit, a little bit about your chances how they have improved since 2010, 
which are the the profiles with the with the highest chance of success uh, and so on and so on and um, after that we're gonna um, go right into the most meaty part of this webcast we're gonna talk a little bit about how to prepare and how to practice for the competition and it's um, well worth uh, staying until the very end of the webcast which uh, is going to be about at around uh, six o'clock because we have a special offer um, to help you in your preparation okay so um, what are the five profiles uh, that uh, are offered? You already you are already you are already in one of them, so this is just a very quick, quick overview. We have European Public Administration, which is the most generalist profile. Uh, we have law, economics, audit, and ICT, which is an abbreviation that stands for Information and Communication Technology. Um, so, as I promised, just a couple of words about the basics. Until 2010, all the pre-selection tests uh, were held in English, French or German. That's how you took them uh, in 2010. Um, in 2011, they changed this uh, system. They, first of all, um, made the situational judgment test uh, a scored mandatory part of the exam. And later, they also changed the language of the test uh, in that um, people who um, uh, participated in open competitions after you in, in later years, they took these tests in abstract, uh, sorry, in, in English, French or German. Now, um, since this is a repeat of the 2010 competitions, EPSO wanted to replicate the exact same con uh, conditions as um, in 2010, uh, which means that you are again going to take the exam in English, French and German, not in your first language. Um, also an important thing to remember that there is not going to be a situational judgment test and the reason for this is that in 2010 the situational judgment test was not yet scored and um, I guess EPSO's thinking is that uh, if, the, if a test is not scored then why bother uh, retaking it or having candidates retake it um, and, um, and that's why you don't have to sit that again so um, that's all about the uh, basics. Uh, now let's talk about uh, the number of positions and, and, uh, and um, calculate a little bit about uh, your chances of success. Uh, the number of positions is the same as, in, as there were in 2010. Um, in total, um, uh, almost uh, around 300 positions. The highest number of positions is available in public administration. Um, the second highest is available in uh, information and communication technology. The third is uh, audit. And then we have quite a few positions available in uh, economics and law as well. Now, why is this important? You can't change uh, your profile anymore. So why do we talk about this? Well, the reason is uh, that we can also look at the number of applicants or the number uh, number of applications um, uh, as compared to 2010. Um, as we can see from this chart, uh, there's a marked drop in the number of candidates in your numbers, basically, uh, compared to 2010. And since the number of positions is the same, this means that your chances are well, if not exponentially, but quite significantly increased. Uh, I guess the most significant drop occurred in the European Public Administration profile. Um, less than half uh, of the people who applied in 2000 applied again in 2013. There's a very significant drop in law as well, uh, economics, basically all of the profiles uh, to, to a certain degree. Um, in all profiles, the drop is more than 50%. Now, uh, what does this mean in terms of your chances? Um, using the example of uh, the audit competition, uh, sorry, the audit profile, um, while in, in, uh, in 2010, there were 46 people for each uh, audit position on the reserve list. In 2013, there are only 18 people to one position and that means that your chances in 
well, almost quite almost tripled and your chances to um, to get into the assessment center from the pre-selection phase is even higher because um, EPSO usually invites uh, three times as many people to the assessment center as there are positions available in the reserve list. So if there are uh, 18 people for one position, then that means that every sixth person um, from the pre-selection will be invited to the assessment center. And, and that's great, and uh, that's almost unprecedented um, uh, in EPSO competitions. So let's look at how to actually get one of these jobs. Uh, because that's the most important um, topic and let's all admit that's why we're here uh, tonight. So just very quickly the process, um, after they've determined your eligibility, which in your case was done in uh, 2010, um, the next phase is the um, pre-selection tests, that's what we're going to concentrate on tonight. Um, if you're successful there, you're going to go to the assessment center. We're going to touch on that uh, a little bit later. And if you're successful there as well, you will be placed on the reserve list from which you can be recruited in much the same way as in, uh, in any other um, private sector position. You're invited to a job interview um, and hopefully you will then be offered a position. So, the pre-selection phase. Um, as we already covered, this consists of abstract reasoning, numerical reasoning, and verbal reasoning tests. Just a quick overview of the uh, scope of the test. The abstract reasoning test consists of 10 questions, and um, you will have 10 minutes to answer those. Numerical reasoning, um, again, 10 questions, 20 minutes uh, to answer them. And uh, finally, verbal reasoning, uh, 20 questions and 35 minutes uh, to answer them. All right, sorry about that. It's a couple of windows popped up. All right. So, um, what do we have to know about um, these tests? Let's start with... Um, the scoring. Um, the scoring, uh, two, two terms you need to be clear about um, when it comes to scoring. First of all, there's a pass mark you need to reach, uh, and that's usually, uh, well, not, that's always 50%. So if you can get 10 points in abstract reasoning, that means that you have to achieve uh, uh, at least five uh, to, to reach the pass mark. In the case of verbal reasoning, the total is 20 points, you have to reach 10 at least. Um, but that's not enough. That's just in order to be at least considered uh, for the assessment center. Also, um, EPSO is going to make a list of your score and they're going to, they're going to draw a line and those um, X number of candidates with the highest scores will be invited to the assessment center. Uh, you can see the pass marks and, and the scores in this uh, summary table and um, you can see that um, the pass mark as well as the weight of the tests is very important. Verbal reasoning alone accounts for 50% of your score and numerical reasoning and abstract reasoning together account for the other 50%. Alright, um, before we get into the little methodological um, introduction to, to pre-selection tests, let's just quickly overview the assessment center phase. Um, if you're invited to the assessment center, you're going to have to sit a so-called structured interview. Um, you will perform an oral presentation. Uh, you will take part in a group exercise. There was, there was, there's also going to be a written case study, which is basically the only uh, test in the entire selection process where your professional knowledge will be tested. And uh, just to make sure that your first language is really your first language, um, whatever essay you write about the case study or in, in, in the course of the case study, you'll also have to uh, briefly summarize it in your first language uh, in the course of the assessment center. Okay, so once you're on the, uh, once you've been successful at the assessment center, you're on the reserve list, it has a validity, it's usually one or two years, um, and that's where you can uh, be recruited from into um, um, any number of uh, EU institutions. And the last step in this process, as I already mentioned, is the job interview for the 
concrete position that you were offered. So um, let's look at um, how to pass the pre-selection tests exactly and we're going to talk about uh, four things um, practice, simulation, persistence and methodology. Um, simulation means that uh, it is advisable and very uh, important that you try to simulate the conditions of the exam in your preparation as uh, closely as possible. So if uh, the exam is uh, done on a computer then try to practice on a computer as well. If you have 20 minutes at the real exam uh, give yourself 20 minutes um, in your simulation as well. Um, if the exam is in a quiet place, which it, which it is, then try to practice in a quiet place as well. And um, the good news is that um, EU training um, helps you recreate these conditions and, um, and, uh, and that can be very helpful in, in combating stress at the real exam. Persistence means that um, you, have to be, uh, you have to be strong and keep up your motivation in the process because this is it's still a long process about um, nine months from start to finish and and you have to keep motivated because uh, that's the only way to to take one challenge after the next um, the methodology uh, is important because uh, even though these tests are uh, so-called ability tests there are ways to improve uh, to improve your performance at these tests and um, and this is what um, I'm going to introduce in this webcast and which you can learn more about uh, in our webinars So when it comes to um, practice, um, duration is important. You can't start uh, one or two days um, um, before the exam, but probably even more important is um, not the total duration or the total number of questions that you uh, practice, um, but its intensity and its regularity. Um, if you have a total of, let's say, 200 practice questions, it will result in much, much, much better performance if you um, practice those 200 questions in 20 question batches over 10 days as opposed to sitting it all in one go on a Sunday afternoon. So um, that's about uh, the generalities and then let me show you um, a few things, uh, a few tricks um, uh, through one example of each test type, one verbal reasoning, one abstract reasoning and and one numerical reasoning example and and this is a little um, introduction into what we are doing in much more detail in the online EU training webinars as well. Um, the first um, thing I wanted to uh, show you is uh, the is a verbal reasoning um, uh, example. I'm sorry well, I don't know why these uh, squiggly lines are there. Uh, they're not supposed to be there, but um, it seems that PowerPoint wants me to write in a US uh, spelling. Um, but we're not going to do that. We're going to follow the good old British spelling here. So let me give you a, a few seconds to read the text and the, the answer options, and then we're gonna, um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what are some of the things to, to watch out for in, in verbal reasoning. All right, so um, hopefully you are getting to the end of the text. Um, I'm going to read out the statements themselves, so um, don't worry about uh, those. So the text is basically about a phenomenon uh, called... Uh, called habituation. Um, and... Um, 
the answer options uh, are statements related to the text. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm just um, being told that um, some people have uh, audio problems. Um, I'm going to try one thing and, and restart the stream. Perhaps uh, that helps. So just give me a second and uh, the, the video and the audio will go out for a, for a second and then it will come back. All right. Um, All right, so I'm back. Uh, hopefully that solved the problem. And um, we were talking about verbal reasoning tests and uh, we said that um, each verbal reasoning test consists of a text passage and four statements to consider based on the, uh, based on the text passage. And your job is to select uh, the, um, your job is to select the uh, correct uh, statement. Okay, I'm just being told that uh, this uh, restart seems to have uh, solved uh, the audio problems. So um, that's good because this is the uh, most um, substantial part of the uh, webcast. So um, you've all read the text passage, let's uh, read the statements. To imagine you are eating chocolate can reduce or satisfy a craving for it and for foods you usually consume with it. So let's see uh, what we know about this statement. Um, and why it's difficult or less difficult to, um, to consider a reversing test. Uh, when it comes to uh, the text passage, obviously the topic can make uh, a reversing test more or less difficult. The syntax, how long the sentences are, and also the vocabulary, how many uh, adjectives um, and adver adver adverbs um, are used, um, how familiar you are with the vocab, the lingo, um, it's very important, although most of the verbalizing tests will use standard uh, vocabulary. When it comes to the statements, we will see that there are three kinds of statements, true, false, and uh, cannot say type statements. We will address in a minute uh, what that means. So let's consider the first uh, statement. Once again, to imagine you are eating chocolate can reduce or satisfy a craving for it and for foods you usually consume with it. The first part of this statement, the, the part that is um, underlined um, on screen, is it's, it's true, isn't it? Uh, to imagine you are eating chocolate can reduce or satisfy craving for it. That's what the text passage, passage states um, and that's what uh, is called um, um, this form of habituation. Um, the problem with the statement is that it has a second part which says and for foods you usually consume with it. Is there anything in the text passage uh, that um, states that uh, thinking about a type of food can reduce a craving for other foods as well that you eat with it? So for example, if you think about meat, um, does it reduce your craving for potato or salad as well? There doesn't seem to be anything um, in the uh, in the text passage that states that, but also there's nothing in the text passage that uh, denies that. And this is a typical case of a so-called cannot say type statement. It's very important to, to notice these because um, these statements, uh, you cannot prove them to be false, but you have to remember that you cannot prove them to be true either. And your job here is to pick the one and only true and correct statement, so you can't mark this as the one. So let's look at the next one. Physical cues, such as a full feeling in the stomach, more directly influence whether we stop or continue eating than psychological ones. Um, again, there are several things in the statement that uh, um, line up well with the text passage. The text does talk about physical cues or symptoms, for example, uh, full belly feeling. Um, so that seems to be uh, okay. It also states that these uh, cues influence whether you stop or continue eating. And it also talks about uh, psychological cues, uh, such as habituation or the size of the plate that can influence your hunger. However, the statement also makes the additional claim that um, the physical cues more directly influence this than the psychological ones. And again, we find that there is nothing in the text passage to support this claim. 
However, remember, there's nothing in the text message to refute this claim either. And uh, that means that, um, again, we have to conclude that answer option B, or statement B, is a so-called cannot say type statement. We can't pick it as the correct answer. Let's see C. Having little or no desire to eat bananas after eating them for two weeks straight is an example of habituation. Let's see. Having little or no desire to eat something after eating them for two weeks or to, eating them, to eat them for a, a long period of time, um, that's exactly the definition of habituation according to the text passage. Uh, so, um, so that seems to be correct. One strange part or one strange thing about uh, this statement is that it talks about bananas, whereas the uh, text passage doesn't say anything about bananas. It talks about chocolate and, and um, names some other types of food uh, and other addictive things such as smoking, but it doesn't mention bananas. And that can be very confusing and uh, it can result in you uh, doubting your judgment whether this is the correct answer. But remember that um, the text passage defines habituation in general terms and the statement mentions bananas as an example. So um, there's no contradiction there. Uh, the statement uh, is in agreement with the passage in the, in the definition of um, what habituation is. Bananas are only provided as an example, so we can feel free to mark this as the correct answer, and this is going to have to be this is going to be um, what we need to pick in order to get one point for this question. Now, just um, for um, methodological uh, perspective, let's look at answer option D as well. Visualization techniques have been shown to help people eat less and thereby lose weight. Um, very interesting statement as well. A visualization technique, it's an expression that hasn't come up in the statement, uh, sorry, in the text passage uh, at all before. So that can be confusing at first, but if you read the first sentence, according to new research, imagining eating a specific food. Well, if you imagine something, it's basically the same as visualizing something. So as it turns out, this is just a synonym. And just because the statement uses different words doesn't mean that it is necessarily false. But let's look at the uh, remaining parts um, of the statement. It says that these techniques have been shown to help people eat less and thereby lose weight. Is this um, claim supported by the text passage? The text passage says in this last sentence that the new study may lead to new techniques for people looking to control overeating. So, um, it talks about the same thing, but there's a very significant difference. The text passage talks about a future possibility, whereas the statement talks about a, a, a present or past fact. And this is why this statement will be false, because it presents a future possibility as, a, as fact that has already been proven. And this is something that you need to be very careful about in verbal reasoning. Um, not to mark a statement as correct, which presents something in a different mode as, uh, as um, it is done in the text passage. So this was just a little introduction into the various methods and tactics that you can employ and that we um, go into much more detail, uh, for example, in a verbal reasoning webinar. Um, let's talk about abstract reasoning. Um, abstract reasoning tests are always divide people. Um, some people think um, it, um, it's the best uh, test type EPSO uses because, um, um, well, you don't have to read a lot of text, you don't have to calculate, you just have to look at pretty little um, figures and, and figure out which one uh, comes next in the series. Some people hate it because uh, uh, it requires um, a different kind of intuition than, than other test types. So um, this is, again, uh, a, a test where there are a lot of methods and, and tactics that you can use and, and uh, we address quite a few of these in, in, uh, in proper two-hour uh, webinars on online EU training, but let me show you one uh, little tactic that, um, um, that can be useful. Um, 
The first thing that you should do when you look at an after reasoning test, uh, remember it's a series. You have to look at the top row of figures, read it from left to right, or look at it from left to right, and you have to figure out what the sixth figure will look like based on uh, recognizing the rules that govern the series, and you have to pick the sixth figure from the five available answer options at the bottom. So, what is the first step in, in, um, in doing that? You should, always, um, uh, you should always take stock of uh, what you have in the figures. And in our case, we can see that we only have circles, no other shapes are available, uh, but these circles um, appear in increasing numbers from figure to figure. The next thing you may notice is that not all the circles are the same. Some of the circles are white or unshaded, some other circles are black or shaded. Uh, so that's also going to be an interesting, uh, an important thing that will play a role in, um, in, com in coming up with the correct answer. Um, the third um, thing that you may notice is that some circles appear in the, on the left side, at the bottom, some on the right side, at the top, and there are some circles, always shaded ones, that appear in the middle. So if you consider all this, um, after a while you will come up uh, with at least one rule and um, that probably the easiest rule to come up with is that the number of circles on the left and right sides increase by one in every figure. So on the first, in the first figure we have one on each side then two, then three, then four, and then five. So in the sixth figure, we need, we must have six figures on each side. Um, now, what if you get stuck here? What if, what if you can't come up with the next rule? Not to worry, because even if you come up only with one rule, you will only, you will already be able to kind of exclude um, two of the five answer options because it can be correct answer can be D or E because uh, they only contain five five circles on each side. So what could be the next rule? And the next thing that you may notice is the shading, or the, the black or shaded circle on, on the left and, uh, and right side. Well, first of all, a circle is on the sides is only shaded in every second, um, in every second uh, figure. So there's no shaded circles on the sides in the first one, in the third, and in the fifth, but there are shaded circles in the second and fourth figures. Now, this is not enough yet because um, that wouldn't allow us to narrow our choices from the remaining A, B, or C, but we may also notice that um, the, um, that, um, the shaded circle or the black circle appears at the top the topmost position on the left side and the bottom position on the right side. Um, and if we consider that, then we can exclude answer options A and C as well, because in A, the shaded circle appears on the top side, both on the left and the right, and in answer option C, the shaded circle appears at the bottom both on the left and the right, which doesn't conform to our rule. And we now we are now able to pick um, answer option B as the correct answer. Um, now, there's also a rule governing the circles in the middle, but as it turns out, we didn't even need that uh, to pick the correct answer. Um, now, there are many other shortcuts and, and methods you can employ, and, um, and uh, there are also um, very useful lists of different phenomena that you, you need to um, watch out for in abstract reasoning, uh, you know, the kinds of operations that can happen to shapes, you know, like uh, they could move around, they could rotate, they could be mirrored, and um, we talk, a, talk about a lot of these uh, at, at methodology webinars. Um, the reason I keep mentioning the webinars is because if your um, if your um, pre-selection test is after June 6th, then you might be interested uh, in this season's last online EU training uh, AD uh, webinar, which will be held on June 6th, and that will cover abstract and verbal reasoning. So, um, 
if you think uh, tips and methods like this can be helpful and you're helpful in your preparation, then feel free to join us. Okay, so let's see the uh, third uh, test type, which is numerical reasoning. And um, numerical reasoning again divides people. Some people love it because it's um, much more logical and, and down to earth um, than uh, abstract reasoning. It um, and perhaps even more than verbal reasoning. This is a kind of these are, this is a kind of test where you can imagine um, it being useful in a real work situation as well. If you um, if you end up uh, working in one of the EU institutions. It is very possible that at some day you might have to look at um, birth statistics in various European countries, for example, just to refer back to this uh, particular example. So that's why a lot of people love it. Other people hate it because um, math or mathematics has never been their favorite subject um, and a couple of years have passed uh, since university or since high school actually because this is high school mathematics that these tests use and um, and it's basically an inconvenient and uncomfortable experience having to refresh your memories from high school mathematics but again what are you gonna do this is a necessary part of the uh, pre-selection process so you have to improve uh, at it um, so let's look at an example and let's see a couple of things that uh, we can do. Um, the question goes as follows: In Belgium, the natural birth share, the, the natural birth share from the total number of births, is 20% above the European average. How many natural births were there in Belgium in 2005? Um, now, when it comes to a numeric reasoning test, the first and hardest part. Uh, is probably to make sense of the um, the question itself and and to gather the uh, data or uh, information needed to um, uh, to calculate the correct answer. And how do we do that? Well, let's first concentrate on uh, figuring out what the information is that we will need to use. Um, the first thing is the number of births in Belgium. That's certainly going to, we're certainly going to need that because um, that's what the question is about. How many natural births were there in Belgium? So we are going to need the total number of births. Um, the European average natural birth share is also mentioned. So we are going to need to use that, which is marked by this uh, lilac or purple color in the pie chart it's 34.2 percent um, in Europe that's the average share of natural birth in in the total number of births in Europe the third piece of information actually comes from um, the question text itself um, which is the fact that the share of natural births um, All right. Um, I'm again sorry for the interruption. Uh, let me continue from where uh, we left off. Um, so we were talking about the three pieces of information needed uh, to to answer this question. Um, we said that we are going to need the num the, we're going to need the total number of births in Belgium, uh, which is 174,000. We are going to need the um, Average share of natural average share of natural births in the total number of births in Europe, which is which is coming from the pie chart, thirty four point two percent. And the third piece of information is the fact that in Belgium the share of natural births uh, from the total is twenty percent above the European average. So now we know the three pieces of information we are going to need to use. The next task is to figure out how we are going to calculate it. And obviously, the way we are going to do it is to first calculate the share of natural births in Belgium from the European average. And once we have that, we can use that percentage and the number of total number of births in Belgium uh, to calculate the number of natural births. 
So, step one, share of natural births in Belgium. And here comes a very tricky part. Um, a lot of people um, say that, okay, so if the share is 20% higher than the European average, well, the European average is 34.2%, this one is 20% higher, so it has to be 54.2%. Um, but that would be a fatal mistake to make, because the that would actually mean that that would actually be the uh, 20 percentage points higher than the European average. What we're looking for is 20 percent higher than the European average and to calculate that we need to calculate 20 percent of 34.2 percent and add it to 34.2 percent or in other words we multiply 34.2 with 1.2 and that will result in 41.04 percent. Now we know that that is the share of natural births uh, in Belgium. The next step is to calculate the number that this represents. We know that the total number of births is 174,000. We convert 41.04 percent into 0.4104 and that will result in 71.4096. Uh, now remember that that's in thousands, so we have to multiply that by a thousand, and that will result in 71,409.6. Now, you can't give birth to 0 0.6 uh, children, so we can round that up to 71,410 uh, natural births in Belgium and that will mean or that means that answer option A is the correct answer. Um, now a lot of people um, say that okay so if your result is the same as one of the answer options then um, you can kind of lay back uh, and, um, and, um, and be confident that your calculation was correct but that's not the case uh, even if your calculation resulted in a number that is among the answer options, always double check because sometimes the incorrect answer options are, um, let me put it this way, created strategically um, because the test author tried to anticipate the mistakes that you might make uh, and they devised answer options that will match your result if you make that particular mistake. So don't just rely on whether your result matches um, one of the answer options. Be confident in your result independent of the answer options. So um, there are a lot of uh, other tips uh, and tactics that you can employ, but the basic uh, summary is that first you interpret the data, then you come figure out what kind of calculations you need to perform, um, and then you perform those calculations. Uh, that's basically the gist of it and if you uh, break down your preparation into these three uh, into these three steps and you practice uh, each of them then you can be assured that you can increase your performance um, again if your um, pre-selection test is after June 11th um, then we have one last webinar that you can participate in um, that will be dedicated exclusively to numerical reasoning um, so uh, if tips like this uh, you find useful then feel free to join us um, now closing out um, slowly uh, the webcast and the topic um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the tools that you can use on online EU training to to keep yourself motivated and to improve your performance when it comes to webinars, um, they're not just longer and more detailed than a webcast like this, um, but there are also some interactive tools. Uh, you can chat and ask questions from the presenter, which uh, the presenter can answer live. So that's very useful if you don't understand something you've always wanted to ask. Um, you can do that in the webinar. Uh, you can vote on the correct answer and see how others voted um, to understand better your, your weaknesses. 
we do um, we go through a lot of examples and we also provide a, a theoretical or a methodological overview as well um, when it comes to to practicing tests on online EU training um, one feature I very highly recommend is um, is um, the revision and statistics page um, you can uh, look at your uh, past tests, see how you performed in each domain. It's like you can filter for verbal reasoning or numerical reasoning. You can look at your correct, incorrect, and unanswered uh, ratios. Uh, you can select multiple tests and um, and compare your performance uh, uh, over time. Um, and one other feature that is always very popular uh, with people is the the revision. Um, mode where you can look at your past test, look at explanations, you look at the correct answer, um, and uh, for a couple of um, for for over a year now, you can actually retake uh, your past tests a number of times, uh, which can also be very helpful in in um, in practicing and and um, and uh, repeating uh, what you've learned or what you've um, come up with uh, in your preparation. So the revision and statistics page is highly recommended. Now, now that we're talking about uh, practice tests, um, I we have a special package for um, for um, uh, people preparing for the Pactitis exams. Um, the package is basically special in that um, the um, the proportion of test questions uh, test questions in them or in it. Are um, suited or tailored to to the practice of the exam. They don't contain situational judgment test tests. So that's our recommendation uh, for uh, your preparation. Um, we also have two ebooks that I like to recommend. One is we have a very nice workbook uh, which presents one abstract, one numerical, and one verb reasoning example in a very much detail. Um, and a um, user our users love this uh, because. Um, um, it shows in much in a lot of detail how um, to successfully tackle uh, these test types, um, and we have a, a comprehensive comprehensive um, uh, ebook on the 87 most typically asked questions about EPSO exams, and you will be surprised um, how many other people are interested in the same questions as you are. So that's also uh, useful uh, to check out. If you also want to practice on the train and on the plane and uh, in your car, if you're not driving, then um, um, the best offline preparation tool is the Ultimate EU Test Book. Uh, the Administrator uh, 2013 edition came out recently with all new um, test questions. So if you have the 2010 edition, don't worry because uh, all the questions are new and they are also completely different from the ones uh, on online EU training. So, um, thank you very much uh, again for your uh, participation. I am um, sorry if some of you have experienced some audio problems. Uh, if you have uh, questions or you need advice, uh, feel free to contact us using the contact form on EU Training or directly at support at support.eutraining.eu. Um, you can also check out our huge selection of tips and tricks articles at eutraining.eu slash tips tricks. Um, and um, I would like to thank you for sticking uh, with me tonight and as I mentioned we have a special offer for you um, the end of the pre-selection test exam period is June 18th so it's uh, number 18 is a very important uh, number um, to remember uh, and to commemorate that we are offering you 18% off on all EU training packages and webinars. If you want to take advantage of that, then use the code 2010 again uh, in all capital letters. And this code is valid for 48 hours. So that means that uh, you can take advantage of it until the 31st of May 2013, 6 o'clock in the evening, because it's uh, 6 o'clock now. So um, um, hopefully that will be helpful in your preparation and this is especially just for you uh, those of you who stuck with me throughout the entire webcast and I would like to wish you good luck and a very pleasant evening <laughs>